Ladies and Gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Österreichische Nationalbank uh, to this conference on the investment outlook for Austria and its implications for the green transition. Um, as we have waited for five minutes now for all of the people to be able to attend, I would suggest that we start now. We all have been aware that the climate change poses a risk to our ecosystem and the recent events, the geopolitical events have shown that economic dependency on fossil fuels uh, can threaten economic stability also in the very short run. To tackle these challenges, uh, the European Union and its member states have decided to become carbon neutral by 2050 and have adopted a carbon reduction target of 55% by the year 2030. These are, of course, ambitious objectives, uh, and they involve equally ambitious investment flows. Uh, these investments shall enable us to increase the supply of renewable energy, to reach higher standards in energy efficiency, or foster the deployment of a new infrastructure for non-fossil fuels. We also need to somewhat change the technologies to heat our houses and the mode of the transportation. The European Commission estimates that we will need annual investment of approximately 360 billion euro for transforming our energy system. At the national level, our government has developed an energy and climate plan and strategy that asks for additional investments of 17 billion euro until 2030. Maybe Director General Schneider from the Climate Ministry will present more details on this. But as you can see, that's a huge amount and uh, at least a significant amount. And uh, the topic is of high importance. Uh, overall, these are remarkable amounts. Uh, it's likewise um, uh, essential and a challenging task to provide funding for that, this uh, on our financial system. Of course, there are obvious tasks for national governments in dealing with climate change, because in the words of Lord Stern, climate change is the greatest market failure ever. Uh, a healthy climate has characteristics of a public good and therefore private sector actors sometimes lack sufficient incentives to invest in climate protection. It is well established that pollution and carbon emissions generate negative externalities and that the effects of these externalities are not reflected in market prices in an appropriate manner. That's a problem that can be tackled by a carbon tax. And we also know that there is a problem of asymmetric information because investors often lack the necessary information to correctly estimate the carbon emission of uh, firms or projects, so they cannot assess the exposure of these firms to the risk of higher carbon prices. For many of these problems, we have market-based solutions. For example, once a carbon tax uh, changes relative prices so that they correctly reflect uh, the social costs of carbon. Markets can operate efficiently again, or if firms are legally obliged to disclose the carbon uh, footprint, investors can assess their transition risks more precisely. But there are problems for which we do not have market-based solutions, and here the public sector uh, has a role to finance necessary investment, for example, when it comes to the provision of a new energy infrastructure for renewables. Now, some of you may ask, how does all this concern a central bank? Our mandate, of course, obliges us to safeguard price stability. And only if that objective is fulfilled, monetary policy shall contribute to the EU's general economic objective. So there is a clear primary objective of price stability and uh, also to amend financial market stability. 
a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment is just one of these additional objectives of, of, of the EU. But in the latest review uh, of uh, the monetary policy strategy of the ECB, uh, we emphasize the commitment to ensuring that uh, Eurosystem fully takes into account the implications of climate change and carbon transition for monetary policy and central banking. This means that uh, the design of the ECB's monetary policy operational framework will be adapted in relation to climate-related disclosures, to risk assessment, corporate sector asset purchases, and the collateral framework, just in line with the primary objective uh, of the ECB. These are the implications uh, that climate change and the green transition will have on the conduct of monetary policy. But we also have to consider the effects of the green transition on financial markets in general. As I pointed out, financial market stability is the other main objective of a central bank and the euro system. So this transition will be accompanied with uh, risks that, that may amplify through the financial system. The transition of uh, new forms of energy generation will decrease the demand for assets that are backed by fossil fuels. Unexpected price changes caused by new regu regulations or sudden moves in, in market sentiment could turn these assets into stranded investment, causing credit risk, causing liquidity risk, and so on for investors. For central banks, which are tasked in, uh, with the maintaining financial stability, it is therefore of utmost importance to assess the exposure of the banking system and financial markets toward these transition risks. To accomplish this, uh, we here at the UNB have performed the climate stress test on the Austrian banking system last year. Uh, we simulated the impact of carbon pricing on banks in three different scenarios. Business as usual, as a baseline, then an orderly introduction of a carbon price and some kind of disorderly transition with a sudden and high introduction of carbon pricing. And we find that the disorderly scenario uh, that assumes that the carbon price is introduced later, but then at the higher rate, being more disruptive uh, on firms and certain economic sectors, we, we see that most importantly, agriculture and transport um, uh, are affected uh, where default rates could rise sharply. The impact on the banks exposed to these sectors would be sizable um, and notable, but still manageable. That, that's also important. It is uh, worth noting that there is risk and that it can be measured and uh, that the magnitude of this risk should be taken into account. But on the other hand, financial markets and the banking system are resilient and uh, will be able to cope with, with this in a manageable way and, uh, and orderly. This means, uh, in general, the banking sector in Austria is in a good position to withstand risk from green transition. And that's also a good news because there is uh, a, a good starting position in implementing such necessary measures without being at high risk of financial instability. Just uh, one Concluding words or some, some thoughts on, on the role of central banks and regulators. I would be, on the other hand, uh, rather cautious against proposals that central banks and financial market regulators should use their potential toolkit to actively redirect investment uh, away from carbon intensive production towards renewables or other forms of uh, green finance. We have to keep in mind that the regulatory framework serves the purpose of maintaining financial stability. So it's important that we implement our instruments to reduce risk in the financial system. And uh, since we're often not in the position to assess the exact risk of green investment projects, uh, regulators would not be able with confidence to decide if these projects entail less risk to financial stability or others are of higher risk. And uh, that's very important. 
we are responsible for making sure that risk, that means physical risk, that means especially transition risk, is taken into account fully and in a correct way within the risk management frameworks of the financial markets and the financial market agents. Um, I am looking forward to today's presentations and uh, discussions. And I'm very glad that uh, our colleagues from the European Investment Bank uh, uh, were able to come here uh, and, and also in person. Unfortunately, that's not possible for me at the moment, but I'm very much looking forward and uh, I would like to hand over to Vice President Oestros for his opening remarks. remarks. Mr. Vice President, good to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Governors. And ladies and gentlemen, both you, those of you that are here in real life and those of you that are connected uh, digitally, uh, warmly welcome to this uh, seminar. We are really honored to have this webinar today in Vienna, hosted jointly by uh, the Austrian National Bank and the European Investment Bank, EIB. It is a well-established tradition to present the findings of the EIB Investment Survey uh, around Europe, but also, of course, in Austria. And we are particularly pleased to do so today. Indeed, this is a very particular moment for Europe and the entire world, in which the understanding of the main economic challenges ahead of us is of key importance to be able to navigate into the future. And as we all feel, we come together under a time of great sadness for Europe with a major conflict on our own soil. The EIB, the EU Bank, has been active in Ukraine since 2007. And our thoughts are with all our friends, family, colleagues, and partners from Ukraine. We will stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people and our commitment to support an independent Ukraine and restore and improve the lives of its citizens will remain steadfast. In fact, just very few days after the war broke out and the Russian aggression took place, we gathered our board and decided to provide Ukraine and Ukrainian authorities with an immediate liquidity support coming from the EIB in close cooperation with the European Commission. 668 million euros that uh, was the we were the first multilateral development bank to take the decision and to start the disbursements immediately to Ukraine. And this money is to be used for immediate needs, uh, everything from healthcare, food supplies, energy supplies, and medical supplies. We are stand ready also to continue our support as soon as we have a situation in Ukraine where people can start to think about other, than, other things than only defending themselves, but also rebuilding their country. And we stand ready with uh, first the 1.3 billion euro package for the first stage, but of course the cost and the needs will be enormous uh, in this situation. The EU Bank uh, also plans to develop, develop rapidly a humanitarian, social and economic relief package to respond to the flood of refugees that is now coming into the Ukraine no neighborhood, not least in European Union countries. The war threatens the European Union economy with a twin problem, from com coming from continuing dramatic increase in energy prices and massive uncertainty. Like it did uh, with the pandemic, the EIB therefore stands ready to support the EU through another time of crisis. And I will leave it to the other speakers here this afternoon to talk, talk in more detail about the, some of the implications of the war on our economy, including how it will affect the energy and green transition that is so needed going forward. Turning back to the issue of investment in our own economies, we at the EIB feel that this is a much needed discussion. EU economies are moving out of the unprecedented shock that the pandemic caused. Of course, the war is another shock to our economy where we do not really fully see the consequences yet. But we need to think about how to increase and improve investments to also see to that we are ready for the challenges ahead. So how Europe, Austria, and its firms are positioning themselves in this new environment obviously will depend on investments. 
Speaking of which, uh, the EIB have continued to support investment at an unprecedented scale during the pandemic. In 2021 alone, the EIB group scaled up the activities, providing a record of 95 billion euros in financing, up from 77 billion euros in 2020. And the main reason for this great increase in our role as an actor in European investment was the European Union's massive and prompt response to the crisis. The European Union members created a European Guarantee Fund at the disposal for the EIB, almost 25 billion euros, that we then could use to have, do high-impact investments uh, thanks to the support from our member countries. Almost half of the group's financing, 45 billion euros, went to small and medium-sized companies, SMEs hit hard by the pandemic. But as you know, we are also in the middle of transforming into the EU climate bank. And what does that mean? Well, we have a climate bank roadmap that our board took a decision a year and a half ago, which points out very clear the milestones to reach this target. In 2025, 50% of our investments will be directly climate or environmental related. The rest, the 50% plus, everything that we do shall be Paris aligned already from this year. That means that we cannot do investment actually harms our way into climate neutrality. That means also that we have an energy lending policy that is not supporting carbon-based energy production. Gas, oil, unabated gas, oil, coal is not uh, uh, any, more, any longer put on our balance sheet. And we are concentrating our efforts into renewable energy, energy efficiency, and transmission of energy. When it comes to Austria, the total financing volume of the EIB group, consisting of the EIB and our subsidiary, the European Investment Fund, reached 1.56 billion euros. That's, uh, that, that amounts represent 0.39% of Austria's GDP. Last year, the EIB provided support for almost 20 operations in Austria in a, in a variety of areas. The main driver, of course, was the high demand for liquidity due to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially to support SMEs. We also focused our engagement on investment in sustainable infrastructure in Austrian cities and regions, such as public transport and affordable housing. Finally, to strengthen competitiveness, we also supported financing for Austrian research, development and innovation, from semiconductor technology to biotechnology. Coming back to our investment survey, we can see from the results that the policy response to the pandemic by the governments in the EU countries, including Austria, was targeted at firms that needed that support the most. This helped them to preserve investment. This meant that the economies performed better than had been expected when the pandemic first hit. However, more challenges lie, lie ahead, not at least the effects of the war, but also the urgent need to support the climate and digital transition. And I'm convinced that the climate transition presents opportunities for Austrian firms and for European firms in general. Indeed, we see from our survey that Austrian firms share this view, with more companies seeing the climate transition as an opportunity rather than a risk. And almost half of Austrian firms, 48%, have already invested to deal with climate change or plan to invest. Nonetheless, realizing the climate transition will require, require mobilizing private and public investment on a large scale over the next years. Only in energy. Today in Europe, we invest about 200 billion euros annually in energy sector. The European Investment Bank provides 13 billion of that. The European Commission estimates if we are going to reach our targets, the investment volume in energy annually must reach 400 billion. So it is certainly a, a great challenge that we have ahead of us. A key lesson from the COVID-19 crisis is that we need to avoid a protracted period of subdued investment, which would exaggerate investment gaps in a number of areas. After the global financial crisis, it took more than a decade to get investment back in Europe to the level it had before. Following the pandemic, a robust policy response has helped us to rebound more quickly, 
but we cannot afford to have new fractures reopening or deepening against the background of the war and the climate emergency unfolding. At the EIB, we have demonstrated that creative instruments and complementary between budgetary support and financial tools can effectively unlock and catalyze investment, even against the background of very challenging external circumstances. Let me just give you an example of uh, when the pandemic hit early January, the first reports came in 2020. We had been collaborating with a firm called BioNTech then for a couple of years, financing their cancer research on an MNRA platform. They reached out to us when they uh, discovered what was going on and said, let us see if we can use this platform to create a vaccine. And we started a new cooperation on that basis. And they became uh, the provider of one of the most used vaccines, a truly European project financed by Europeans and saving people all over the world. I now will hand over to my colleagues, Deborah Revoltella, Chief Economist at the EIB, who will present the results of the EIB Investment Survey for Europe, and Matteo Ferrazzi, Senior Economist at the EIB, who will zoom in on the results for Austria. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you will have an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be in Vienna physically today and uh, being uh, back at uh, the Austrian Central Bank uh, and have an opportunity to discuss about our view on the investment situation uh, in Europe and in Austria, and also discussing uh, about uh, um, how we see the, the challenge related uh, to the green transition in the current context. And it's uh, really refresh, re, refreshing to see. I know that a lot of people are uh, connected online, but uh, seeing uh, the people uh, in the room is uh, really refre refreshing. And it's something uh, we should uh, all try to get back at doing more. Um, what I'm going to present is uh, the results of our uh, annual uh, report. We uh, analyze the investment situation in Europe. We have a special survey that uh, looks at uh, firms all over Europe, 12,000 firms. We also have a component focusing on the Austrian market. And uh, we use this uh, to understand uh, and uh, having a pulse of uh, what's uh, really happening uh, on, uh, on the ground in terms of investment. The analysis has been done, uh, um, actually has been published in January at the European level, so it's looking at, uh, at uh, the COVID period, a phase in which uh, we were uh, happy actually recovering uh, from the COVID pandemic and seeing a strengthening growth. On top of this uh, comes, uh, we know, the, um, the, the war in Ukraine with uh, the tragic toll uh, that uh, we all know, but also with uh, the economic repercussion uh, at the European level, in the region, at the European level, and also at the Austrian level. So what I will do is uh, to uh, discuss uh, the overall outlook, uh, but also try to give uh, a pulse of uh, where our concern in terms of, uh, um, of effect, uh, um, of economic effect, uh, maybe in terms of uh, transmission. What do we see? The economic resilience of Austrian economy for, to the pandemic was uh, strong. Actually, policy support at the European level and at the Austrian level was uh, quite uh, successful in avoiding uh, the worst uh, from the pandemic. And uh, Austrian firms, actually, in what we see, took the opportunity to start uh, transforming. And that's a very positive message that, uh, that uh, we got uh, from uh, the reaction to the pandemic. Today, we see an additional source of challenge coming. The challenge is uh, the economic, uh, the new economic shock that we see. We see part of the shock already materializing. Probably it's uh, the, the first part of uh, the energy shock. There are uh, more uh, risks in front of us. And the concern is uh, 
how to navigate this additional shock on the previous shock while keeping the focus on the green and digital transition. There is a part of a positive element, if you want, energy security can be combined with moving forward with the green and digital transition, but that means a very strong policy take in willing to combine the two energy. Um, the, the, the green transition and uh, energy security. I will uh, start uh, presenting, and I think uh, the first part is uh, really an obvious, uh, so the, the shock, the COVID shock uh, coming up, uh, European and Austrian level, uh, both were very strongly affected, uh, both were recovering uh, quite well. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, we had uh, actually GDP going back uh, to uh, pre-COVID uh, um, levels with uh, some weaknesses uh, coming back at the Austrian level. I think very much mirroring also what was coming uh, back uh, um, in uh, Germany in the same period. So the last quarters uh, a bit more uh, soft um, softening. In terms of uh, investment, uh, what we saw as well is a big shock and uh, recovery almost completely. And we see also the component, uh, actually the shock mostly coming on the corporate side, the government sector uh, trying to be more on the positive side and also household uh, quite uh, positively impacted in terms of uh, cumulative investment dynamics. But uh, again, and that's, um, that's uh, 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 one of the important messages uh, that uh, it took uh, relatively short period of time uh, for investment uh, to go back uh, to pre-COVID levels, uh, both at the European level and also at the Austrian level. The policy support was important, uh, and here uh, what we have is uh, through our survey it's an interesting instrument because we could ask actually to firms whether they suffered the losses due to the pandemic, whether they received the policy support, and then we know what the firms are doing with this policy support. And the message that we receive at the European level is quite positive and is confirmed at the Austrian level. What do we see? Um, more than half of Austrian firms tell us that they had an impact, a negative impact in terms of sales due to COVID, and it's similar to the European level. Uh, there is uh, some uh, new opportunities uh, created by COVID, and uh, that's uh, again Austria is performing uh, more or less in line uh, with uh, the European level. Then we look at uh, policy support. Policy support. Uh, um, more than 60% of Austrian firms receive policy support. It can be in various ways. What is interesting is in Austria, much more than on the average of Europe, you see much more relevance of subsidies rather than particularly guarantee credits. That's the utilization of the guarantee credits. So they may have been offered, but the firm didn't take it because there were subsidies. I, I, I assume a firm prefers a subsidy rather than a guarantee credit. And uh, what we see is actually that puts Austrian firms in a positive uh, point of view because uh, then in the recovery phase, uh, you don't have to pay back the subsidies. Uh, you can just think at how to go for, further. And that's uh, kind of uh, in terms of uh, the policy offered. But then uh, what happened in terms of the policy support? The first part, uh, that's uh, again, it's uh, mirroring uh, what's happening at uh, the European level. The general message is that in Europe and in Austria, what we see is that the policy support is well allocated. It didn't go to zombie firms, but it went quite often to firms that actually had a shock due to COVID in terms of reduced sales. And what is interesting is that actually the policy support allowed the firms to continue to invest and transform despite uh, the contraction in terms of sale. So isolated the firms from the shock of the crisis and let them continue to invest. 
And that's quite interesting. We see the same uh, at the Austrian level. We see that uh, the policy support uh, went uh, um, more likely to the firms uh, that uh, were recording uh, sales. It's not shown uh, sales uh, dropped, uh, sorry. Um, it's not shown in the graph. We also check that they didn't go to zombie firms ex ante. And that's uh, important because it was also like a pre-requirement of most of the support programs. But the, the first graph really tells you it mostly go where, went where it was really needed to firms that received the policy support. There was a little go that the firms that received perceived as our sales dropped. Only little went to firms that were not affected. And then the second one is what I was mentioning before. It helped firms, more or less always, to, to preserve their investment plans despite the sales dropped. So that's a positive message in terms of the policy support that we have seen. We also look at two other things. We ask firms if, as a reaction to the pandemic, to COVID, they, uh, first of all, whether they reacted in the short term, and then second, we also ask whether they think that overall, the COVID pandemic will require a transformation of their way, uh, the way of uh, behaving in the, in the long term. This is uh, the short term, and actually it's uh, another positive message. Austrian firms actually took the pandemic as an opportunity to transform, and in particular also to become more digital, slightly more than at the European level, to develop a new product, and also they were, but that's not that much, it's 10% both at the EU and the Austrian level to shorten value chain. But what is interesting is really this taking the, the pandemic as an opportunity to transform. And that's, uh, the, it's uh, almost 70% of the Austrian firms. It's slightly more in large firm rather than in a small and medium enterprises. The second part of the story is what the firms think that the pandemic will generate, and that's a long-term impact of the pandemic. And actually, what you see is that both at the European and the Austrian level, you actually see that the firms think that the pandemic will bring a long-term transformation, and actually most of them think that um, digital transfer, digital technology will be most indeed need. And actually, Austrian firms uh, tend to see for all the category that we see um, digitalization, uh, supply chain, and service of product portfolio change, so basically innovation, uh, they tend to see slightly more than at the European level a need for uh, long term change. So somehow, in all of this, uh, um, the pandemic, uh, um, the pandemic uh, somehow was a way in which uh, the, the, the Austrian firms uh, navigated it uh, relatively well, had a lot of policy support, mostly subsidies, and this uh, allowed the firms uh, to continue to transform uh, and actually accelerated a little bit uh, the transformation process. I also wanted to show something uh, that is interesting. Uh, we through our survey, always uh, we have a picture of uh, the digitalization, uh, the adoption of advanced digital technologies on the side of firms. You can compare uh, Europe, uh, Austria, and the US. You see that actually Austria, particularly in some area, robotics uh, platforms uh, tend to have, uh, but also 3D printer, the big, uh, um, big data, tend to be quite advanced uh, above the European average, uh, and, uh, and also it's interesting uh, to, to see that uh, there is uh, some, some uh, uh, positive uh, comparison, particularly in robotics, also, um, also compared to the uh, US. So if uh, we come out from the pandemic on the, uh, with a positive view, uh, what are the concerns on uh, the new context? Uh, I think uh, uh, the war, war in Ukraine uh, is uh, not a localized shock. Uh, it's, a, first of all, a, a tragic uh, situation uh, which brings, uh, um, brings a toll in terms of human life. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we have uh, the, the, 
the, the tragic consequence that, uh, that we are all uh, witnessing, but uh, it's also a large uh, geopolitical uh, transformation, uh, and it's also bringing uh, economic costs that uh, go behind uh, the, uh, the, the Ukra Ukraine per se. And uh, I think uh, we um, try to look at uh, what are uh, the economic consequences uh, what, uh, the, of uh, the war and uh, the transmission channel uh, to the rest of, uh, of the region, uh, of Europe, uh, and then also of uh, Austria. And here uh, we have uh, to consider uh, the war per se, what's happening in Ukraine, the change in the geopolitical context, uh, but also the sanction associated to Russia as uh, potential uh, other uh, current risk and potential other uh, um, uh, future risk. And here uh, we try to look at uh, the contagion channel. Uh, looking at contagion, uh, we look at, uh, first of all, uh, the energy and commodity shock. That's uh, the immediate one. We had already an energy shock, uh, particularly in terms of prices uh, in the last, uh, in the last, uh, since, uh, since uh, um, last year, we had already the, the, the price energy shock that was materializing. It's materializing uh, as a much more, uh, uh, less transitory, let's say, more permanent uh, shock, uh, staying uh, longer than originally expected. And that's uh, the immediate uh, channel uh, uh, that we see in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, transmission of the shock uh, to the European economy and also to the Austrian economy. The Austrian economy is also showing uh, quite, um, that we, we still don't think uh, uh, we still don't, mon don't internalize a, a quantity shock in the sense that we are still uh, waiting to see what will happen in terms of a quantity transfer blockage. But uh, for sure, the Austrian economy has a particularly sensitive uh, should that happen. But the energy shock in terms of prices is already there. In terms of trade links, I think the, um, the European economy, at the European level, we are not too worried. There are some areas that are particularly affected, the Baltic countries. Um, but at the European level, if we exclude the energy, the, the energy part uh, in terms of uh, uh, direct trade shock is not a major issue. Um, there are two other elements that is probably not a re strictly trade uh, for a di direct investment and the rule of uh, cross-border companies. So this is uh, something where uh, the Austrian economy is likely to be more affected than, than other. There may be more positive or uh, pessimistic or optimistic views. But uh, I think on the cross-border side, the concern of uh, uh, frictions and uh, uh, heightened uh, political risk uh, in the region uh, may, may actually affect, uh, um, may affect more and brings more uncertainty to the business environment and uh, Austria is uh, more sensitive. On FDI, it's also a matter of uh, uh, incoming FDI in Austria other than uh, uh, not only um, outgoing uh, uh, FDIs. Financial sector exposure at the European level, I think the, the understanding so far is that there are some banks being affected by the overall, uh, the overall crisis, and particularly there are five banks being affected. I think it's not a novelty who the banks are, particularly not here, uh, here in Austria. Um, I think uh, there is a good understanding uh, that uh, uh, we are not uh, talking about uh, systemic risk. Uh, we are talking about uh, potential losses uh, for, uh, for, uh, um, for uh, some institutions. But uh, the concern uh, is uh, that uh, at the European level, uh, we may not see all. So what we see now are the direct effect of uh, um, of the new geopolitical uh, transformation of the sanction, uh, etc., but uh, the, the, the complete unfolding of all uh, the effect uh, may take longer. But uh, for the time being, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the channel, uh, channels. And then uh, the last one is uh, the refugee crisis uh, that, uh, of course, uh, 
brings a lot of, of uh, um, officials in terms of uh, how to organize uh, the, the, the reception for uh, the uh, refugee, and also this is going to have, uh, again, uh, an impact in economic terms. With all of these, uh, these are the transmission channels uh, that we look at, uh, but then uh, we try also to think as uh, what does it mean, all these uh, new shocks uh, that come in, all do they fit uh, in the economic situation? I was just uh, saying uh, we were seeing a recovery. At uh, the European level, uh, we were a bit worried uh, that the recovery was coming up. It was good, but uh, uh, corporate households uh, still had uh, to show resilience uh, to a normalization of policies. And now, on top of this, a new shock is coming in. What are the potential uh, effects on the recovery? And I think uh, the, the key challenge are uh, the uncertainty, uncertainty weights, and uncertainty weights on households, on companies, uh, and this uh, may have an effect uh, on investment activities. Higher inflation, the commodity channel and the supply, potential future supply disruption, and again, higher inflation, more protected inflation impacts on households on the one side, on the disposable income, on, on, on confidence, and it also impacting on the corporate sector. Again, I'm talking more of maybe on the European side, but we were coming out from a crisis like the COVID crisis. We didn't see any non-performing loans. It was a very unusual situation. And now we have another, and it was probably because of the very strong policy support. What we needed to test was how resilient the, con the, the corporate sector was to a normalization, and now we had an additional shock. So the concern is what will happen next. Next, And then uh, the impact on public finance, I think uh, what we see is uh, a lot of uh, need, uh, additional public finance uh, needs, uh, military spending is one, the other one is how to compensate the most vulnerable from uh, the energy shock that we are seeing. All of this is coming as additional public expenditure after the all public finance development that we have seen over the COVID period. So it's an additional pressure on public finance coming from a very stretched situation um, again. So that's an additional point. And all of this brings us to the last point, and then I leave the floor to Matteo. What does it mean for the climate transition? It's a lot of pressure on the climate transition, but it's also coming at the times of needs for energy security. And I think all of this brings an opportunity if we wanted to see that. So trying to relook at the functioning of our energy market at the European level, try to move forward the concept of energy security, climate transition, all together for a real transformation of the energy market going in the direction of the, of the green transition. But that's one of, I think on the policy point of view, uh, that's something where the alignment of, uh, um, of focus should continue. And I leave the floor to Matteo for continuing more on the green side and particularly on Austria. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, for the people here, and thank you for those uh, online. Uh, so I will continue leveraging on, uh, on, uh, on the data of our survey that uh, can give some uh, different and very specific point of view. Um, so uh, I would like to concentrate on the green aspects. So how this new outlook that was uh, presented, how this is impacting the green transition. So this is adding to the current uh, challenges, and in particular, we will see how important is the focus on, uh, on investments. Uh, let's start from the physical risk. So um, we asked to the firms in general, Deborah mentioned that we are interviewing uh, 12,000 companies in Europe uh, and almost 500 in Austria. And uh, we were asking how they perceive the physical risk, so the manifestation of uh, climate risk, the, the floods, uh, the, the strong winds, extreme events, and so on. So 60% of Austrian firms already report that weather events are having an impact on their business. 
and this is a quite a high amount in line with Europe, but uh, this is uh, quite a clear message. And 18% uh, report a major impact. So probably this is the, the climate events are starting to be visible on their profit and loss. So it's becoming something uh, very tangible for uh, in Europe and in particular for uh, also for Austrian firms. Uh, let's move to the transition risk. So this is more related with the regulation, the changes uh, that are um, deriving from the new regulation, the decarbonization of the economy. And uh, the interesting point here is that the position of Austrian companies, companies seems to be better on average than uh, the average of Europe, especially because almost one third of Austrian companies, they see the transition as an opportunity. So uh, they are not only scared about the, the, the decarbonized new world that we will see in the future, but uh, um, they see it as an opportunity. Of course, most probably most of these firms are in the sectors that are serving this decarbonization of the economy. Still, there is quite a, a relevant uh, part, uh, almost one fourth, that uh, see the transition as a risk. So there is quite a big chunk of companies in Austria and in Europe even more that they see this as a risk. And 46% uh, of Austrian companies, they see no effect on their business. So this may shrink in the future probably because mm, many will see effects. Um, another aspect, so I, I'm trying to analyze the different uh, starting point. Of course, these questions were asked before the events in Ukraine, uh, but this is the starting point of Austrian firms, and I think it's a good assessment to understand how this will, will evolve, and I hope it will be touched during the, um, the seminar today. Uh, so are Austrian firms investing to deal with climate change? Yes, more than uh, Europe on average, so 48% of Austrian firms uh, invested already to deal with the climate change, and the same amount, again 48%, they are planning to invest during the next years. So this is quite relevant uh, share. Um, as I say, this is a little bit bigger than Europe. It is not so different than last year, so this is quite constant. What is interesting here is that there is quite a big uh, divide uh, between the large companies and small companies. First, you see that the large are investing more and plan to invest more and between and among the manufacturing companies versus service and construction sectors. So uh, this, is divi this divide is something that uh, should be taken uh, into account and this is common in, in many other countries. Now, another aspect. So when we deal with the climate change and the transition risk, we are very much normally focusing on the decarbonization of the economy. And that's why we are uh, thinking about the deployment of renewable energy. But I think we should not forget about the uh, energy intensity. So this is the bringing to the energy efficiency. So it's not only a matter to, to check the carbon intensity, but also the energy intensity. So how much energy we use for each uh, euro of activity. And this is the picture of energy intensity in, in Austria and Europe. So, Austrian firms, almost half of Austrian firms, already invested in measures to improve energy efficiency. So they also see probably a positive payoff because, of course, they spare energy, and this will be more and more in the future given the high prices. So the starting point is that uh, uh, almost 50% of Austrian firms were already taking some action to be protected about uh, to be protected by higher prices of energy, for instance. But again, you see that there is a gap between large and small and medium enterprises, and also the sectors are quite differentiated. Of course, the manufacturing sector that is more energy intensive, and here we have representative of, of some of these industries, the manufacturing sector was, more, uh, uh, was investing more in energy efficiency. Um, so still a good picture for the Austrian firms in general, but uh, uh, you see that the, the, these aspects are, are moving quite fast year over year. Uh, then we have also another uh, focus, uh, and this is a bit uh, specific. So it's, it is on the management practices uh, of uh, firms. Here we have four, uh, four different aspects. The use, use of strategic monitoring system, uh, the link to the 
so of the performance of the company to the pay of the managers or employees. And then we also check the, um, the capability to, more, to set and monitor internal targets in terms of CO2 emissions and energy consumption. So this is uh, the green bar is showing a green aspect of uh, corporate governance. And then we also check the, the, this is the violet bar, uh, the uh, strive for gender balance. So, in general, we know that the, the management of Austrian firms is rather good, uh, but you see that uh, the, um, there are some gaps here in the, uh, in the, let's say, the green aspects and also the gender balance aspect if you compare Austria with, uh, with Europe. So this is what the firms are telling us, that they, uh, on the green aspects, uh, they only, let's say, less than 40% are setting internal targets on carbon emissions and energy efficiency. So there is some gap here versus you that is quite interesting. Again, you see the gap large versus me, very strong. This is common in all the European countries, but still to be managed. One more aspect uh, to conclude. Uh, we also asked to the firms uh, about the barriers to investment. This is not specific uh, to green investments, but this is particularly true also for, for green investments, as, as we will see. So we asked to the firms why you're not investing enough uh, or, or which are the main obstacles for you. And as you can see here, the main obstacle for, uh, uh, for Austrian firms is the availability of skilled staff. Uh, this is true everywhere in Europe, but you see that uh, the problem is more acute in Austria. Uh, of course, we, are in a, we were in a period of big changes, of a very fast digitalization, greening of the economy, and typically when there are big transitions and big changes, you lack uh, the necessary skills to, to face all these problems. What is interesting here is that uh, Austria is, seems to be more exposed, probably because it is running faster on these topics, so it seems that the lack of uh, skilled staff on these aspects is, is, uh, is quite relevant. Um, and especially, you see many firms, 70% uh, are saying that this is a major obstacle. So it's not a generic obstacle, but it's a major obstacle. So this is bigger than Europe. On the right side, you see that uncertainty was also very high. And this was be before the war. So this was one of the main concerns. So you can imagine now that this will for sure, for sure be bigger. Uh, in general, I would say that uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis, was, was not having a terrible impact of, on the availability of finance. This is true in Europe, but especially in Austria. So you see that the, the aspects related to the skilled staff are really uh, standing out from, from this picture. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, we have seen from the previous interventions that the recovery in Austria was gaining uh, traction uh, last year, was growing uh, very strongly. But still, the, we have seen the transmission channels and, uh, and the Austrian economy will be affected. The new scenario is requiring another round, again, another round of uh, adaptation. And we have seen that Austrian companies were adapting to the new scenario, to green investment, to digital investments, but still they are signaling some bottlenecks, especially on the, on the availability of staff. And again, the focus on investments, uh, as the Vice President was saying, to, to avoid, the, to, to remain with investment gaps for years, this is uh, a crucial aspect. So I hope that uh, our survey was useful to set the stage for the discussion uh, that will happen now uh, to identify the investment gaps and the possibilities to, to go further on the green and digital transition, especially uh, given the current, uh, the current situation. So I thank you very much for your attendance and I will leave the floor to the panelists for their interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Hello, and the ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists. We are waiting actually for Herr Schneider. No, he won't attend because he. He won't attend at all? So he will be online. I, at least, okay. I can yes. see you and I can exactly. hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me and see me. Hello, Herr Schneider, welcome. Um, Welcome from the Austrian National Bank in uh, Vienna. My name is Marina Delceva. I'm a journalist and the head of the economic department of the Austrian newspaper Wiener Zeitung, which is, by the way, the oldest still, still printed newspaper in the world. 
Um, today, I have the honor to lead you through the panel, financing the investment demand for a greener economy, where does Austria stand? After our discussion, I would like to invite the audience um, to join us. You can ask your questions via chat or just raise your hand and press the button in front of you. And before we start, let me please um, shortly introduce our panelists to you. Sandrine Grosset, hello, Director of the European Investment Bank. Gerda Holtinger-Burgstaller, CEO of um, the Erste Bank in Austria. Barbara Pottis-Geibensteiner, CFO of the Austrian paper and packaging company Heinzel Group. Uh, Heinzel Holding, excuse me. It's Heinzel Group, yes. <laughs> Jürgen Schneider via Stream. Let me get straight. General Director at the Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, and Innovation and Technology. Hello. And Gabriel Felbermeier, Director of the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, the VIFO. So, um, the war in Ukraine and the invasion of the Russian army are, uh, first of all, a humanitarian catastrophe. Moreover, it has um, a big impact on our economy. It has exposed the vulnerability of our energy markets and um, our dependency on Russian gas and oil. And now it is common sense that we have to diver diversify and to get rid of this um, dependency on Russia. This crisis happens at a time where the EU member states have agreed on climate neutrality by the year of 2050. So my first question is, um, how do you think the current crisis will affect our climate objectives? Will it boost investments towards new renewable energy products or um, do we have to expect some kind of revival of coal and nuclear power? Mr. Felbermeier, I would like to start with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks uh, uh, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, so I think overall uh, the crisis will accelerate uh, the transition to renewable energies. Um, and I think uh, the reason is simply that all, the, all alternatives um, you know, a renewal of coal, for example, uh, would involve also geostrategic risks. I mean, uh, Russia and Ukraine, Russia in particular, is a big exporter of coal. Uh, actually, we have huge imports, uh, Germany, for example, huge imports of, uh, of hard coal from, from Russia. Um, and even nuclear power uh, is an issue here because uh, a lot of uranium ore comes from Russia as well. A lot of technology has been coming from Russia, so many of the, uh, of the projects in Europe uh, on the nuclear power plants, well many I don't know, but some certainly, uh, would have relied on, uh, on Russian uh, technology. So uh, if that crisis now pushes us not only to uh, get out of uh, fossil fuels for, for environmental reasons, but also for geological reasons, I see, I see a lot of complementarities that accelerate uh, that trend. Uh, but, of course, uh, if that crisis pushes us into a recession, so if, if we you know, really have a an, an stop of, of gas imports uh, and we, we suffer from that with uh, um, business failures, high unemployment, uh, bad public finances, even bank failures maybe, who knows? No? So uh, if the situation becomes dramatic, that, of course, per se, is not good for, for all sorts of... Uh, uh, capital intensive processes uh, like the reconfiguration of the energy system. But if the situation doesn't turn that, uh, that path, as we all hope, I think, uh, the, I would expect that the crisis accelerates the uh, energy transition. Sandrine Grosset, may I ask you to, to join the debate? What do you expect from the markets? How would they? might they react to this crisis on a mid-term and long-term basis. Thank you very much also for having me here today. Uh, I think uh, the, the key point in your question was on a mid-term to long-term. 
uh, view because uh, obviously, uh, at least what I expect uh, is there will be two aspects in the response. You will have an immediate response which aims at just making sure that next year, for the next winter, uh, the houses in Europe will not be cold. And then you have uh, obviously the underlying trend, so the mega trend, which is in my view where we should aim at. And uh, I think here uh, the position in Europe has been always very clear over the last years, is that there is no alternative to a decarbonization of the economy. And the current crisis is uh, actually the best example uh, to prove that this point is, is, is the right thing to do. So if you take a step back and you imagine a, a company who invested in energy efficiency measures two years ago, where basically the interest rates were nearby zero and uh, you had plenty of supply, I think today this is, they have the best return on their investment that you can imagine. And what is a bit sad is, of course, when, when companies and, and also the public sector look at um, the return uh, on a, a given investment, which is not an urgent one, but maybe an important one, they always look at the situation as it is today. And they lack a bit of imagination, if you want, and say, well, what if the situation as we have today changes dramatically because we all know over a course of, of 30 years you have big changes. And this is exactly what is happening now. So uh, what I do expect is that, um, of course, there will be short-term measures and, and probably not the ones that we would like to see. Uh, but for the economic actors, they will all realize that uh, uh, all the plans that they had, but who were maybe important but not so urgent, they might become urgent and we might see a wave of investments in energy efficiency, which is one of the biggest leverage that we have, but also on R&D to try to find the solutions, the technical solutions that we currently don't have to decarbonize also other aspects of, uh, of the economy. Thank you. Uh, the new EU taxonomy is labeling gas and nuclear power under certain requirements as green, um, which has provoked a debate whether this will redirect investment towards gas and nuclear power projects away from renewable energy projects or not. Um, in Austria, nuclear power is a total no-go. We have agreed on that, I think, in the year 1969. Um, but gas is quite an issue for us. So, Mr. Schneider, what is your expectation? Will the EU taxonomy have an impact on um, the investment process in Austria? And is the war, uh, the war in Ukraine now a game-changer? I'm looking down at my feet because this is where I see you. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, once again, thanks a lot for inviting me to this very interesting discussion. And I, I can tell you, I would have loved uh, to be with you at the Austrian National Bank, but in the morning I had some flu-like symptoms, so I thought better spread some ideas, but not spread viruses with you. Hope you appreciate that. Well, I mean, is the Ukraine uh, a, a, um, war, uh, the, the Russian aggression against the Ukraine, a game changer? Well, in, in the short term, uh, that's, um, that, that I guess um, it, it, it has huge impacts, which we, which we, which we already see. And, and it, it, it was a reminder that when it comes to energy, we do not only talk about sustainability, which was in the focus in the last few months, um, talking in, in Brussels about uh, Fit for 55 and, and um, climate neutrality in 2050 in Austria in 2040. But now we have learned um, that um, we still have to care also um, about security of supply and affordability. And let me say, I mean, Austria is heavily dependent on the import of fossil fuels. Um, Mr. Felbermeier mentioned that they import coal. Um, uh, we uh, do not extract coal in Austria, so our import is 100% of what we use. 
for crude, it's over 90%, and also for natural gas, it's over 90% uh, because the Austrian extraction has shrinked in the, in the most recent years. And uh, what does that mean economically? In a normal year, we have an, a fossil energy bill um, of about 10 billion euros. It might amount this year around 20 billion euros. The big advantage of renewables is uh, that they are usually um, they are usually come from Austrian sources. We do import a little bit of electricity and we do import a little bit of biomass, but really um, um, the majority of it is coming is coming from Austria. When it comes to the taxonomy, I mean, there is a political answer and there's a, a there is a scientific answer. I mean, we've heard we've heard many years natural gas is a clean, is a cheap, is a secure fossil fuel. Natural gas is not clean, it damages the climate, it's not cheap. We have seen price peaks uh, before, uh, during the corona crisis with prices around 10 euros per megawatt hour. We had the highest peaks around 340 euros a megawatt hour, and obviously it's not secure. And I can tell you, I was last week at the European, at, at the Environmental Minister's Council, and a, a Polish colleague of mine said, Natural gas is a transitional bridge, but what we see, the bridge has collapsed. So what we uh, what we uh, would like to do is really leapfrog directly into a renewables world. But I can I have to confess, there might be others who would like to switch back, for instance, to coal. So the on, on the short term, it's 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 really uh, to diversify. Um, we have also, uh, well, as we speak, um, we, we discuss a national act on a, on a strategic reserve for gas, which we have drafted last, uh, last week, basically. And it's now discussed in the, in the, in the National Assembly and to, uh, to, uh, to have additional security. But uh, on the long run, there's no question uh, the answer is renewables. Because we also see renewables is uh, the cheapest form of energy. If you look at the electricity markets, and we have huge peaks in electricity markets with a so-called merit order, so that means the electricity price on the market is determined by um, uh, uh, the uh, variable costs of those um, of those installations which you need to cover all the demand. And we have hours when that is a renewable energy and we have energy uh, electricity prices of 30 or 40 euros per megawatt hour. But most of the times it's gas fired um, power plants and then we have electricity prices of around 300 euros a megawatt hour. So on the medium and long term, just one direction, uh, rush into renewables. And I see that also on, on the European level with a recent discussion on the, on the revision of the, of the renewables uh, directive on the energy efficiency directive. So I would argue, um, yes, we have to do some short-term measures and the, the, the government announced the package uh, last weekend. Nevertheless, the main direction, medium and long-term, is towards a climate-neutral uh, renewable energy system. Thank you. Ms. Crusader, um, European International Bank has um, yet decided that it will not fund fossil and nuclear power projects. But um, do you expect a relocation of investments on the, um, within the European markets and on the international markets from the private sector? Uh, maybe which investments uh, are you referring to? The, the energy ones or the general supply chains? Uh, the energy ones towards energy. nuclear power and ah, gas okay. and a little bit away from um, renewables. Uh, it is maybe a bit too early to, to tell uh, because when you, you read now the news, it seems that a lot of things which were decided maybe two years ago are again on the table. Um, but what is clear is that uh, if you want to build, for example, a new power plant, it's not an immediate solution. Uh, there are power plant projects which are 10 years late. So obviously this will not help you out of the crisis. Uh, and now I am leaving aside the issue with uh, security and with dealing uh, with the waste, which is another one. I'm just saying that if you have concretely uh, an energy pro uh, problem now, the nuclear power plant is probably not 
the solution to your problem. On coal, it has already happened because, uh, for example, last year the emissions from China exploded in, in CO2. We had a record year, and this was due to coal generation, just because coal was much cheaper than any other alternative. So, yes, there is a temptation because here in Europe we do have uh, still power plants which maybe <coughs> have been just stopped or are about to be stopped, and of course there is also certain abundance of coal. Um, I'm not saying that's the right solution, actually not. At TIB, we, we take the view that uh, this is not the future. Um, now, on, in, on renewables there, we, we expect that actually they, they will be a, a boost. Um, because, again, the opportunity cost is another one. Now versus one year ago. Plus, um, even if you decide to diversify uh, away from Russia, I mean, the alternative supplier of oil and gas, usually they don't look also that stable and, and uh, unreliable. So you have also to take maybe a long-term view, and uh, for us at least, uh, we, we have the, the view that uh, on the long-term view, which is important, our focus as a long-term lending institution. Renewables are really the way to go. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Buxdala, how does the EU taxonomy affect um, you as a bank in funding energy projects? And um, is the war in Ukraine probably a game changer when we think of gas uh, projects? Thank you, and thank you also for having me here. Um, I think the, the current situation and the war in Ukraine uh, and the connected energy crisis is really and should be a wake-up call to all of us. And I think this uh, has already been made clear by also the other panelists. Uh, and if I may, there was one one comment on your slide, Rebecca. Uh, I think you you had climate transition versus energy security. Uh, and I think it's not a versus. And, 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 and I think we also need to be very, very straightforward when talking about these uh, things because it is, and, and it is very much linked. And, and, and uh, you have already mentioned the, the geopolitical risk uh, uh, by the dependency on fossil fuels. And I think a climate transition is very necessary for energy security. And, 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 and there, just, just if I may, please apologize, one, one remark to this. And back to your question, so on the, on the taxonomy. Um, let me give you the picture on what we see in, in, in we, as Erste, we are one of the uh, biggest financial service providers in, in uh, CE. And we see and in particular in Austria. So I think there we are more matured than maybe in other countries when it comes to ESG topics. We see a very strong towards ESG funds. Yeah, and I'm now looking uh, at uh, retail clients and just as an example, uh, in as the asset management, this is our, our asset management company uh, in Erste Group. Uh, the increase in 2021 um, in funds uh, by retail clients was more than 90% related to ESG funds, yeah, be it uh, sustainability funds, as uh, social funds, uh, various uh, types of these funds. And uh, there is a very strong interest in these funds. Um, as the asset management has a very long history, they already started their ESG concept more than 20 years ago. So they, the, the, there was a fund uh, they started in 20, uh, 2001 with the uh, Worldwide Fund. Uh, and the performance is also very good. And this is also... I think one of the key issues where we, that's maybe too early to say. So we've seen uh, over the last five to 10 years, a very strong increase 
when it comes to ESG funds and products, ESG bonds in all various uh, uh, dimensions. But also over this period, they were very much uh, in line and connected to a very strong performance. So there was no difference between an ESG fund uh, or, or maybe the performance was even better than uh, a different fund. And this might change also in the near future, so in the next uh, few years. And uh, for me um, and, and, and for us, it will be very interesting to see if investors, be it retail investors, but also uh, institutional investors are ready uh, to accept lower returns for ESG products. This, I think, has not been answered so far. Um, looking at uh, ESG bonds, there we currently see, uh, and also to give just a little bit the picture, uh, ESG issuance in 2022 is expected to uh, reach a level uh, or exceed the level of one trillion US dollar. So it's really, it's a lot of money flowing in that direction. Um, and currently there is a small cost incentive. Uh, we ESG bonds uh, on average uh, price tighter by two and a half basis points. That's not much. And I think it will be key for the development and also for the future uh, uh, volumes how these price differences will develop. And um, we expect uh, that mid to long term there will be a significant difference and then uh, I think it's very easy to answer and um, to forecast what will happen but in the near future it's not that obvious and uh, this is also where we see a little bit the risk. I wanted to ask you this question a little bit later but please let me ask you now. Um, an analyst of a major Austrian bank told me a few months ago, green is selling like hot cake right now. Um, so my question is, how do you label your products and services as green? And how do you deal as a bank with the threat of greenwashing? Mm -hmm. Because just an ex my favorite example, I could never verify if my credit card company really planted a tree in the, in the Amazonian rainforest as they promised after every payment above 100 euro. I think that's a very fair question. Uh, and when it comes to financial products, now looking at the, at, at, again at the uh, uh, funds, investment funds, I think there, uh, there are, at least in Austria, uh, a few labels in place uh, that I think very well accepted. Uh, it's, for example, the Österreichisches Umweltzeichen, the, the, an echo label, the Austrian echo label uh, for investment funds. Um, and this is what we aim for with our funds. So I think uh, this has been very well accepted uh, and it's very diverse all over Europe. And I think that's also something uh, that is an issue for uh, the European market, that there are so many different labels in place. Uh, now we have the taxonomy. Uh, uh, we still lack a few details when it comes to uh, other industry not being yet included in the taxonomy. Uh, we still uh, lack the details uh, when it comes to social. So we have now the E, we covered the E a lot, but we have not covered the, the S and the G a lot. So I think there is still a lot of um, not clear definitions out and it will take some time to be uh, very honest. What we also did is uh, as Erste, we are part of the green consumption pledge. That's maybe something that is interesting uh, for, for the audience. Uh, this is an initiative by the European Commission dedicated for increasing the know-how of uh, the population of consumers uh, when it comes to labeling, when it comes to taxonomy and different products. And I think this is uh, something where we need to focus on. 
and the taxonomy and the related reporting requirements that will kick in then starting uh, uh, this and next, so over the next years, will also bring some more transparency, but it will take some time. Thank you. Um, the public sector and the European institutions are crucial in funding renewable projects. The EU Resilience Fund, for example, which has an emphasis on um, climate neutrality and um, on sustainability, is worth 750 uh, billion euro. Austria is going to receive 3.3 billion. So what um, is the role, Mr. Felbermeier, of the public sector in general and then of the European Investment Bank in particular in, in funding this green transition towards a more sustainable economy and um, more sustainable uh, energy resources? Yeah, the role of the public sector of government here is huge on, on many dimensions. It starts with market design you know, to get the right price signals. So we have the European Emission Trading Scheme, and this is a, a, a man-made market, as all markets, but it's particularly clear here that this market would not exist without the government framing it and putting it into place and regulating it. And I think it's, it's now important to, to check whether that market works as well as it should, um, because that's, that's the first part of government intervention. Market design is also important in other areas. We have to, to, to ask ourselves whether, for example, the electricity market is well designed in Europe. No? The uh, merit order has been mentioned. No? Um, so uh, the, the regulatory system, no, to broadly speaking, is, 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 is a, big, a big government job. The second government job, of course, is to, uh, to come up with the complementary investments that make private investments profitable. Um, we have a lot of natural monopolies uh, here. Uh, electricity grid is a uh, natural monopoly. We don't want duplicate, uh, to duplicate those grids. Uh, the same is true for uh, a gas system and so on. No? And, um, and here, uh, the, the bottlenecks abound. No? So uh, transmission of electricity from the northern uh, sea, uh, North Sea in Germany, where uh, electricity production is relatively cheap, uh, to even to Bavaria within the same country, and then further on into Austria or down to Italy is is uh, very limited. And uh, and uh, here the private incentives to invest are relatively low. Now there's uh, because of this. Uh, um, um, fragmentation of the market, of the, of the nature of the problem uh, as a natural monopoly. And so we need public money there. We need public money also uh, in, uh, in all those areas where um, externalities exist but cannot be dealt with by prices, you know, where the emission uh, trading system does not give uh, in, in enough guidance, uh, in particular in the area of R&D. You know, there we need, uh, a, need of, uh, a lot of funding. I don't see the, the, the government or EU um, institutions as, uh, as, as important um, in, in coming up what exactly is the right project, what exactly is, you know, in the, in the sense of the taxonomy, what is green, was not green, or half green, or, or green under some conditions, or not green in one country and the other. An electric car is absolutely not green in Poland. It's okay green in, in Austria, right? And so I, I think this is a, an attempt uh, uh, at planification, uh, which is not creating any any um, deep value. You know, it's important to have labels around. It's important to for governments to back up those labels, um, but it's much more important to have the market design right. Uh, if we all know that uh, even you know even with lower energy prices as we have today, if we, if we know that, fossil, that, that burning fossil fuels will be expensive and more expensive in the future and even more expensive in the far distant future, then I'm not worried that uh, investment in capital, private capital, goes into the right, into the right directions. And uh, where we have countries in Europe or companies in Europe that need further assistance and subsidized credit in a sense, I think we have the schemes, the schemes available and that's maybe where the EIB comes, comes in. But, um, but if you get the pricing right, uh, the pricing of, uh, of emissions right, then I think uh, we, we, can, we can and we should trust the markets to mobilize uh, the, uh, the amounts of private investment that we need. 
400 billions a year for Europe. I mean, these are fantastic numbers, uh, but we have the saving, and it's private saving. So uh, I think the job is for governments to make sure that, uh, that, the, that the profitability is there. And the final thing I should mention is uh, we have seen that interesting chart uh, that you put up, I think, uh, or the gentleman, on uh, the obstacles uh, that, that we have. So I think funding, we shouldn't, I mean, here we're talking about funding and that's all right, but funding is maybe not the major problem. The, the, the problems are elsewhere. It starts with uh, a shortage of labor. Who is going to, to put this all into, uh, into place? No? It's, it uh, continues with a shortage of land. Uh, the renewables are very land-intensive technologies. A nuclear power plant is, is uh, you know, is, is a very small unit. It occupies almost no land, produces enormous amount of energy. Uh, renewables require a lot of land, and we don't have much land in Europe. Uh, and the same is true, and now even in this crisis, particularly severe about materials. No investment requires materials. Where do we get the chips from? So if I, if I want to put put to 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 to, to uh, get rid of my old gas heat heating and and go to some more more modern energy system based on electricity, well, I uh, need is not just you know a box where I burn something that is relatively trivial. I need some smart technology. I need the chips. I need raw materials that are very expensive. And so these are the bottlenecks. And government can do something about that. No, we can we can have a a um, regulation that makes land available. Uh, we have, in Germany at least, in Austria too, we've reduced the amount of land available for renewable projects, not expanded it. We, uh, we, we run overly restrictive immigration uh, schemes. We need labor to put things in place. In, in the construction industry, we have ridiculous short, shortages of manpower. Uh, that, that is also a problem for, for getting the uh, the, the investment on the ground here. Uh, and in the area of materials, of course, now we have a war that makes everything worse, you know, but um, here I think we need a much more strategic orientation because we need also for this large scale uh, process, you know, to get, to, to, to get renewables on the ground, we need raw materials of, and we need to be strategic about that, go to the countries where they are available. Most of them are not in, 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 in big abundance in Europe. Thank you. What, um, where do you see the role of the EIB in this transition process? There are many aspects on which we can work, but uh, I would just mention two very quickly. Um, I think indeed the key here is how do you mobilize the private investments because uh, the EIB, the yearly signature volume is 63 billion. So compared to the huge amounts of investments we are talking about, it is clear that EIB is not going to save the world. That's uh, clear. The world will have to do a little bit of work as well. Um, so, but what we can do, uh, and uh, I mean, all the, the, the bottlenecks uh, which were mentioned are, of course, very important, and this is not something where we can help. Where we can help as an institution, as I said, I would see, see two main things. The first is provide a bit of visibility to the private sector so that they can invest. So, for example, when we are talking about networks, uh, we can provide very long-term financing so that the people who want to invest who are not super bankers or super financial analysis, analysts, then they know that, okay, if they invest in, su in such a project, then uh, it has been checked the flows are, the cash flows will be sufficient for this project to, to function in a proper way and to deliver what it is supposed to deliver to the community. The other thing that where we can provide also uh, help uh, is everything which looks like uh, innovation and proof of concept. And there we act uh, not alone, we act with the, with the help of the budget of the European Commission, which provides mandates, and usually those are guarantees, which allow us then to take on risks which we would nom normally not take. So I just give you an example. Uh, some years ago, we helped uh, a Portuguese startup develop a floating basis for wind farms. Um, and this is important because obviously uh, along the German and Polish coast there you have a lot of wind farms and this is easy because the seabed is not very deep. 
but along the coast of Portugal and France, so the Atlantic coast here, then the seabed is very, very deep, so this is why you don't have wind farms. But if you want to use that potential, then you need something else, and this is where the idea of this startup then came in. So we, we financed, thanks to the funding of the Commission, we financed the first proof of concept. It was tested, it worked, and actually last year the EIB financed a very large wind farm in the north of Germany, which, which decided actually to use this type of floating basis. So, and there, once this is done, basically our work is almost done because then the public sector says, hey, this works. And the investor, the investor says also, okay, then I can invest because it looks a bit strange as an idea, but then when you see that it works, then you are interested. And this is where we, we add value. Thank you. Um, the industries and uh, also the households are suffering from um, the currently very high energy prices and the industries as well of the raw material prices. Um, the effects of a gas embargo on Russia would be even severe and probably devastating on the short term to our economy. Um, although there is no alternative to Russian gas right now, I would like to ask you, is there maybe a fast lane to a more diverse, more sustainable, climate neutral um, European industry within the next years? How do you see the current situation? How does it affect the um, paper industry and especially your company? Okay. May I also put some remarks on, on the speakers before? So the first thing uh, which is very, very important for me is the emission trading system, which is not an efficient market at the moment. Yeah? It's a market of uh, speculation, of in, uh, financial investors yeah? uh, really entering into a system which, which should try uh, to, to put the burden on, 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 uh, on those companies, uh, creating a lot of emissions on the other hand, uh, which should also give the possibility of, of selling it. Yeah? What we see at the moment is that it's only speculation driven and that's really a big burden for the industry. So um, I think this has to be rethought, otherwise I think there will be a collapse in the, in, in the near future on this. Yeah? Um, the second, um, this uh, green products um, which are which were sold i think over the last two years and and everybody was 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 going and, and running on, on on this on this product products um, what i saw today uh, i'm in the supervisory board of, of a pension fund and today uh, we heard that already the esg investors are going back to to fossil uh, production and so on, because uh, it, it seems that food, food comes first and, and ethics afterwards. Yeah, so uh, they, they are also not that consequence. And I think uh, there we have to be very careful. Otherwise, I think if, if, if the investors see that they are uh, losing performance, yeah, uh, then they are coming back to, to their old behavior. And I think uh, this would not be a, a good sign uh, for, for the whole public. Um, so the, the industry, uh, I think the Austrian industry is really on, uh, running on bad, so best available technology, because we have certain uh, um, disadvantages out of our structure. We are not really big compared to other um, companies or our competitors in the world. On the other hand, we do not have entrance to the sea. Um, on the, uh, we, we also have high labor costs. So uh, what we were aiming over the last, I would say, yeah, centuries is uh, to decree uh, to to be as efficient as as possible on the energy side, on the on the, the on the people side, and, and so on. So as I think um, the, the the industrial companies, everybody was was aiming for for high efficiency, and I think everybody did or everyone did uh, what was possible. Uh, with the shock of the Ukraine and 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 also the the high. Uh, um, prices on, on gas. I think nobody was prepared on this. Even uh, everybody tried to, to come up with his own non-fossil energy. For example, we invested in hydropower, we invested in solar panels. But on the other hand, if, if you see a paper machine, yeah, it's quite difficult to run a machine only out of wind and, 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 and sun. Yeah. 
that's not possible. So there we are lacking technology and, and there we have also to find our solutions. So these are mid and long term solutions, but not short term solutions. Even then, we were committed, we committed ourselves to be to reduce our CO2 emissions uh, by 35% until 2030. And, and we, want, we are aiming the, the carbon emission neutrality until uh, 2050. So we have to invest more than 500 million euros in this. Yeah? And when we are coming of, to financing, um, I do not see this, this positive picture you showed because uh, what's going to happen? We have inflation. So everything on the investment side is getting more expensive. On the other hand, what does it mean? Interests are increasing. Also, the, expected, uh, the, the risk margin in the banks is going to increase due to a lot of uncertainty which came up with the crisis. So uh, investments are getting bigger out of inflation. Interest as, uh, financing costs are increasing. And, and I would also expect banks that they will uh, be more strict in the future whom to finance because of the outlook or the uncertainty. So uh, I am afraid that a lot of projects will be postponed out of, of the crisis and also the imp impacts on the, on the profit and the loss accounts this year out of, of, of energy costs and, and, and inflation. Because what we see in the paper industry is we can pass through uh, the price increases, the cost increases to our customers. But on the other hand, at the end, somebody has to pay for it. And that's really uh, increasing inflation. And on the other hand, again, the interest rates in the future. How do you see the current situation? Yes, I think I, I, I don't disagree. Huh? I think this is a, this is a lucid um, uh, analysis of the situation. I mean, clearly inflation makes investment projects uh, more expensive. And those, those companies who, who can who also see their 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 prices at the at the sales level go up. No, will be able to cope with that. Those who don't will not be able to cope with that. Um, and as an economist, I would say that could be all okay. No, I mean, I'm not. It's not that I'm. I want to see bankruptcies and so on. But what we do need to get the transition right is reallocation. That uh, those industries where the uh, that that have a um, that, that can cope with uh, higher energy prices and also a normalization of the, uh, of, uh, in the interest rates, no? as I think we have been in a very extraordinary time over the last 10 years. Um, those companies that can cope with that, they should grow, they should invest, they, uh, and, and those who, who, uh, who uh, don't have the locational possibilities maybe in, in, in Austria, they will, from, it's, it's not efficient for them to grow here. And that I'm saying that this is a, this is a painful thing, and I, I know that many don't like that sort of message. But uh, uh, if you think about where in the future are we going to to produce steel, for example, no? I come from Upper Austria, uh, where the biggest steel mill uh, in, in in Austria is, of course. And um, if the future relies no longer rely, rely no longer on coal but on hydrogen, hydrogen needs to be shipped in. I don't know from where, from far. It's probably more efficient uh, to produce steel where the energy sources are. Uh, the the iron ore is is shipped uh, into Austria from Brazil and somewhere else, anyways. No, so just 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 saying that uh, there will be it will be difficult for many sectors uh, and. Uh, uh, that is probably something we should not, you know, try to hide or, or pretend that it could be different. We will need a different division of, of production worldwide. We need energy. The energy that we will have in general will be more expensive. It will be available at different at different places at different prices. No, it's not. And, and what I said before is, you know, with, with electricity production that we could, uh, you know, we, we ship a, 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 a wagon load of, uh, of um, uh, uranium ore into, it, into, into France and, and, and fuel with that uh, a central, a centralized nuclear power station for, for a long time. This is not, this is not the case with, um, with uh, uh, renewables, renewable energies where we need so much space and where we need uh, the climate conditions to be right and so on. So it becomes more space dependent where we produce. And, um, uh, and, and so uh, I, th I think what, what we need to, 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 to say very clearly is that, um, that some industries will have to shrink, others will grow. 
we will have a new, we will trade more. I mean, if if we think we can do that alone, uh, that's that's certainly not uh, not part of of an efficient solution. We will trade more. The patterns of trade will change, and oh, that that process will create losers and will create winners. If we if we try to say that is all to be avoided, we pamper over it, and uh, then the relocation we will need won't happen, and it will be tough, right? So if we want to invest more now with limited resources that we have just by accounting identities now at a national level it can only happen if if we if we consume less for example if investment is to go up and, and uh, we don't have you know uh, the moon or you know if we if we live within the limits that we have it, it will means that it would mean that we need to take the resources from from somewhere else and th these choices I think need to be factored in in, in our discussions and uh, in in, uh, in in the policy choices that are that need to be made. I like your idea of the, the selection of nature, yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it should be under same conditions. Yeah. And if we think about uh, steel, most of the steel of the world is produced in China. So if you ever have seen a, a, a steel plant in China, uh, you you would never travel there again, yeah, because I'm coming out of the steel industry mm -hmm. and I know how they are producing. So, uh, so. Uh, is this the way we want to produce steel in the future because uh, they do not care or, or only start to care about the environmental issues? Yeah? Uh, we are, I would say, yeah, uh, in front of them. Yeah? Yeah. So I would not like First Turbine to stop uh, steel production uh, under their conditions and on the other hand import steel from, from China knowing how they are producing. That's, yeah. that's why we need a CBAM, right? Yeah. We need, we need yeah. a, a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, yeah. Yeah. and we need much more than that. You know, when I said before we need governments to come up with the right market design, this is exactly yeah. the things that we, that we need. What you said about the EU emission trading system is, is also right. I think this is a system that is in need of repair, but it's the governments to take care Absolutely. of it. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and that's what they should be doing. Get the, get the pricing of the externalities right and, and create institutions that uh, achieve that, rather than saying this type of brown coal is good and this type of coal is bad, and if you mm. burn it, you know. So, so I, th I think we, we agree on that. It's the framework conditions that need to be okay. And then the outlook that comes out of it should be left to the market. And I, I would not like uh, First Opinion to leave Linz, of course not, no? but uh, we, we should be prepared you know, under very different cost conditions and market conditions for relocation effects to happen that will be painful and that pain is, is also a source of, of a future growth because it, it allows other industries to grow. It's, it's, it's an illusion to think uh, we can, we can uh, expand and we can have everything at the same time and expand all industries uh, with the limited resources uh, that, that, we, that we have, but, unfortunately. But I think there's one, one can I kick in? Mark? <laughs> uh, okay, then first, Ms. Holzinger, Burgsteller, and then uh, one Mr. Very short Schneider. Just sentence yes. uh, 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 on the discussion. I think there is uh, the pricing. Uh, uh, I very much agree that's something that governance needs to, 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 to get right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also infrastructure and transition assets where governance need to engage more. Because if we if we get there what, where we want to get, then there, at some point in time there will be some infrastructure that is not needed anymore. Uh, this is just for this uh, period in between. And looking at infrastructure projects, and I think you mentioned this, this takes time, this takes years. And if uh, uh, I expect the market to find some investors that are willing to uh, do now huge investments in infrastructure where they know already if everything goes right, they will be obsolete. They will not get any reasonable return. Nobody will do this. So I think this is an area where governments need uh, 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 to, to, to kick in and really uh, develop very concrete plans. And this I don't see yet, I have to say. Mr. Schneider? Yeah, just just a few remarks I have to I, I have to make. Um, I, I I do not fully share the um, uh, the the uh, critical assessment uh, concerning the taxonomy. I think markets need transparency. Market need, need uh, comparability. 
I'm very critical with the complementary um, uh, climate delegated act, which was published by the way uh, at 10 p.m. on the uh, 31st um, of December. But that was not a a science driven or science based decision. That was a political based decision. Until then, we had uh, I think a very strong science base on the on the already existing te taxonomy. As you all know, one is already existing and. And you all know um, that we're going to sue uh, the complementary delegated act when it when it comes into force. I mean, uh, that sounds good in theory. That pricing, uh, we should have the right pricing. You could look either at damage cost or or um, at at avoidance costs. Nevertheless, in reality, we are discussing uh, extending the emission trading system to mobility and the housing sector in Europe. This is very, very complicated, and sometimes it's more easy just politically to achieve to have regulations. So there's not one silver bullet, one uh, CO2 price, which makes the whole job. It's really a combination of different instruments which have to work together um, 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 smoothly and uh, where one has to, uh, to, to, to fit to the other. To the industry, I mean, I, I fully agree with what Professor Felbermeyer said, uh, where will industry heavy, um, 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 heavy energy dependent industry be located in the future? Clearly at places where cheap green energy is available. And uh, it's very interesting, for instance, in, in uh, there is a discussion in Germany and other um, other countries where which is really recognized. Uh, we we have stakeholders in Austria which have opposed against every Ökostromgesetz and so on, up and down. But really now it becomes the, 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 the comparative advantage if we have green energy. And we also look at different instruments. We have mentioned CBAM. We will also, we are working on a carbon contracts for difference system, which is, in, at least in my view, uh, uh, um, a very, well, um, a system uh, where you don't give subsidies, but uh, where you uh, compensate for uh, for carbon prices, which might not tell the truth um, now. So uh, let me just end by saying um, we see it as our responsibility to create a framework where the market can act, uh, but we still need public intervention, for instance, when it comes to infrastructure or, or to, um, um, to framework conditions. Um. Just a brief question from my side, because you mentioned the existing, from your point of view, non-functioning um, emission trade system. How would a more efficient, more fair trading system look like from your point of view? I'm asking myself if it's really fair to give uh, investment funds or speculators uh, entries to this uh, market or to this system. Because if they are only speculating on, on, on increasing prices and selling, we have seen it one day where, where the prices uh, reduced, I think, by more than 50% uh, during the, 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 the crisis, uh, Russia, Ukraine. Yeah? So, uh, and this is not coming out of, of industry or those who have to buy the certificates and, and who have to, to bring them into the system or to deliver them in April uh, because they did the emissions uh, uh, in the year before. So um, I think there we, we really have to be careful that uh, not financial institutions are driving the price. Yeah, so because otherwise they're killing those uh, who really have to go for the, the, the emission certificates and to have to deliver them. So trade should be limited on the industry and those who really need um, the certificates. To, to those who have, have to have them, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to focus in my last question on Austria. Um, Mr. Schneider, where does Austria stand um, at the moment in this transition process? We have um, quite ambitious climate objectives, even a little bit more ambitious than the European Union. Um, and we have also spent a tremendous amount of money during the pandemic. Can we afford as a state a quick transition to new um, renewable energy? system? Well, I, I would argue that we cannot afford not to have a quick transition, um, um, partly to the reasons I explained earlier. 
I mean, we have now in place uh, the so-called Renewables Deployment Act, um, which will bring us 100% electricity from renewables by 2030, by the way, which is a system which does not rely on public money, um, 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 but is uh, financed um, basically uh, by the consumers of electricity. Nevertheless, uh, as I explained previously, that's a good um, um, uh, that's good news. Because um, if if you look at the total uh, total costs, renewables are now uh, the cheapest source to produce electricity. We need to enhance our efforts in the in the building sector. We still have one million dwellings which are heated with natural gas, and I have to say, uh, and around six hundred thousand heated by um, um, with heating oil. Um, uh, there are better and much more secure alternatives and um, but i have to say we are not on the right way and we are not on the right track last year from 100,000 new stoves about 50,000 were um, gas fired stoves um, we have a difficulty that the regulation is as of now with a provincial level and not with the federal level and we are going for a, for a new act with two-thirds majority um, to change that and have minimum requirements also for the heating sector, which are compatible um, with, the, um, the, with the aim of uh, climate neutrality and, by the way, which makes households um, more resilient against price shocks from, um, from um, fossil fuels. Uh, mobility is a very difficult, uh, very difficult area. We will have some tailwind from European regulation regulating uh, CO2 standards for cars and vans, and and we see that the industry is is changing at a pace we wouldn't have we would not have expected a few years ago um, towards um, electric vehicles. And I here also agree, electric vehicles are green if the electricity uh, they run off is produced from renewables. Last but not least, uh, the industry, which is very, very important. And um, here um, uh, we, we will have Europe we have European regulation like CBAM and the emission trading system. But it's it's really our homework um, to to see that uh, when we have um, a good supply with with green energy and green energy basically means green electricity and green hydrogen. There's also a transitional path to that, where um, where we 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 work on, on on instruments to support those who want to shift because it's not incremental improvement anymore. It's really technological shift. Um, as we've heard from um, from 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 Heinz Lico. So I really have to say, so it's still a very long way to go. Um, but in 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 our assessment, the uh, uh, those countries will be on the medium term and long term more, more successful who manage this transition rather sooner than later. Thank you very much for your statements. Um, as we have 10 more minutes, I would like to invite the audience to join us. I've already received two questions from the chat. Um, then I would like to invite you to ask your questions from the audience. Um, the first one is addressed to Ms. holtinger Burgstaller. Would the inclusion of nuclear into the taxonomy as a danger to create, sorry, I'm not <laughs> quite confident with the handwriting, um, a fragmentation of the green market because many investors in green assets want to avoid investing in nuclear energy, want to avoid, sorry. So uh, you mentioned this, I think, in one of the questions uh, uh, in the beginning for, for the Austrian perspective on, on nuclear energy. Uh, is, 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 is um, a very clear one uh, or a very uh, has a long tradition um, and this is also the reason why as yes, the asset management so, so, so our, our, our entity for investment funds decided not to include nuclear power uh, in any of the sustainable funds irrespective of the taxonomy so this is something uh, that we have already agreed on I think looking at the, the European market and on a, on, a, on a bigger level, I think uh, there will be a lot of pressure by the markets 
to increase transparency if it is included or if it is not included. So I think then we have uh, maybe taxonomy aligned products uh, and then we will have taxonomy aligned products plus saying there is no nuclear power included. This is our expectation. Uh, we don't know yet, I have to say. Thank you. Um, another question to Ms. Potik Eibensteiner. Do you think bank credit is an appropriate form of financing for decarbonizing your business? And would you need more innovative financing like venture capital? It's a good question. It depends on the size you need for, for, for your project. Um, so until now, uh, we have sufficient funds ourselves yeah and and on the other hand also access on the other hand to to the banks but also to the capital market so we, we would also be prepared uh, to go for a bond or, or something else i'm thinking more about the the mid-sized and small size companies in austria uh, where they they are lacking equity out of the the two crises now and on the other hand um, maybe they also uh, a little bit behind their investments on the sustainability side so it's, it's the question can they survive uh, without this, these uh, efforts and on the other hand uh, what does it mean if they're really going for more sustainable projects and and there I have my doubts okay thank you yes please I will try to keep it very short. Um, I just have two very short questions. One is related to the other. The current uh, extreme price increases of energy that we see, um, Mrs. Potis Kaibenstein, do you think um, that the measures that have been passed so far by government are enough to remedy these extreme increases? And my question to Mr. Schneider is, in case energy prices continue to increase because the conflict continues in Ukraine, are there more measures in, like, in waiting in storage which, which can be taken by the government to support industry so that industry doesn't get severe problems just because of these short-term supply disruptions? Thank you. I don't know exactly if I've got your questions because with the mask it's quite difficult. <laughs> Um, uh, did I get it right? Um, you ask if, if, uh, if the government, the measures that the government has taken, if it's enough for the industry. Okay, okay. So I think it, 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 it's a good measure and I think it, it's uh, very good for the private households. Yeah. On the other hand, I think um, for the industry, the most important thing is that uh, Every, every tax and, and, and everything which gets to, 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 to the, to the uh, government out of CO2 emissions and, 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 and taxes on, 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 on carbon yeah, should uh, be kept for projects for decarbonization. So uh, we do not want to get uh, a lot of incentives yeah, for, for our projects, but on the other hand, I think uh, if we are going to pay taxes on it, then they should also be used for, for decarbonization projects, infrastructure and so on. For example, if I am thinking about our scope three emissions, where we do not really have a big impact yeah, or influence on them. So it, it's about um, transportation via, uh, via rail. Yeah? So there we do not have the network at the, at the moment. Uh, and and uh, rail cargo is not pr prepared to, to transport everything we want to transport by rail. Mr. Schneider? Very good question. I have to say I don't have a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> you, you, you might be aware that yesterday the, the social partners um, presented their wish list and it, you, might, uh, you might have seen from the media it's a very, very long wish list to ease for the, um, for the price peaks. I also have to say there's very intense discussions in Brussels. We, as we speak, there's a European Council, which means head of states are discussing, uh, of course, the, the Ukraine crisis, but uh, but in particular its uh, its consequences and and also on energy and energy prices. But different groups of countries, um, 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 there are countries which would like to interfere with energy markets. Uh, in particular for electricity market, ASA, which is a re regulatory um, um, entities in Europe, are making an assessment. 
Um, um, we are very cautious with interfering with markets because we need we need in very many investments in the future and and we need stability and security for in, for investors. But um, there might be you know some sort race to the bottom or race to the top, whatever you call it. Uh, Germany today announced that it would also reduce uh, for three months its um, petrol related taxes, something which we had not in our portfolio of the measures we which were presented last um, uh, last weekend. So I really can I cannot say if, if much pressure builds up, uh, it might be necessary uh, to make additional measures. Um, um, but um, I think it's really important not to lose track of, of where we want to go on a medium and a long term and, and uh, for instance, keep CO2 pricing, but really um, distribute the money back um, to those who have paid and, and, and channel it uh, into investments um, for projects to decarbonize, for instance, the, the Austrian industry. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes, please, the gentleman in the back. Uh, one question uh, concerning gas. Uh, isn't it that gas is uh, as bad as coal for the climate? I just remember when we talked in the European Task Force on carbon pricing with our American colleagues, they told us their dirty little secret is we replaced uh, uh, coal by gas, but because of the methane emissions, which are 80, 80 times more damaging for the climate uh, than CO2. Uh, the effect is the same, and we said Russian gas is much, much uh, dirtier than uh, the American gas. So uh, replacing uh, coal by gas doesn't help the climate. Who wants to answer? Yeah, one, one, Mr. Schneider, one please. very short remark from, from, from my side. Um, uh, coal is a fossil fuel and natural gas is a fossil fuel. It depends on um, how you extract it, uh, how many diffuse emissions you have uh, um, during extraction, uh, cleaning, transport. Um, but still, it's it's not a clean fuel. I said that in a, uh, at the beginning. Nevertheless, um, uh, now it's important to diversify. LNG has also not a very good um, uh, greenhouse, uh, is uh, um, uh, not a total um, greenhouse gas balance. Nevertheless, in the short run, we need to supply industry and households with gas, but in the medium term, uh, we have to, uh, we have to, and, and I start to repeat myself, we have to shift to renewables. So, thank you very much for your interest and for all your inputs, of course, for the interesting discussion. Um, we have to come to an end. Welcome. Uh, thank you also for your questions from the audience. I wish you a pleasant evening. Stay self healthy, stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. First of all, I always appreciate highly doing something together with the EIB. I highly appreciate your double role, because on the one hand, you're handing out money, you're really supporting the European and the Austrian economy, but today you acted more in the role of the investment watchdog, and you remind us of our economic duties and where the weak spots lie in the Austrian economy. So it's a very valuable role, and I'm um, a passionate follower of the EIB. But also the other speakers today gave us a very rich, um, um, let me say, wide field of topics. We were treating three crises, three problems, three really difficult um, shocks to the economy. One is hopefully mostly over, that's COVID. One is a current shock, that's the war in Ukraine. And the third one is looming, it's the climate transition. They are all very different in nature, but they all offer upside risks, downside risks, and they have long-term implications. And I will come to the conclusion that hopefully they all boost investment because this is the light motif of today's afternoon. Let me start with COVID. And let me come back to several things which, which were mentioned to get today. 
the upside risk or the, the, the chance, which was mentioned there by Vice President Oestrom, who already had to leave, is, for instance, that there was European technology, which was already standing, not fully prepared and fully developed, yeah, but then with the support of EIB, um, an mRNA vaccine developed in Europe is, of course, an upside risk, and it's going into more product productive technologies and a more digital Europe, which came out of the COVID pandemic. Um, of course, we also see downside risks still from this crisis, like availability of staff in some sectors, and um, more or less, I mean, there are um, there is some scarring of the economy, but as um, Deborah said, we came out quite strong in Austria out of this shock. The second shock is a war. Nobody expected this a month ago. It started a month ago. And I don't want to be cynical and try to find upside risks in this. Let me just mention one glimmer of hope, again mentioned by Vice President Oestrom, that the EIB and also other European actions were very quick in finding funding and giving support right um, at the beginning. I think he mentioned um, the number of 668 million EIB support right at the beginning. The downside risks are, of course, immeasurable. And I would like to say that um, I also think that we will ne not recognize the world coming out after this shock. Um, we will have a deglobalized world we will have the building of economic blocks again. It may be good even for investment, because for instance, on our, we will have to work on our supply chains and make them proofer. We will have to invest in supply chains, but of course, it, this is not the kind of investment which is really, uh, which we were hoping for. And it's the same also that, of course, we will need an investment in Ukraine. It was also mentioned by Vice President Oestrom that um, they stand ready, or we stand ready, to um, hand out funds when this country, Ukraine, can be rebuilt again. But that's, that's, that's I mean, even the word economic sh shock, of course, that not, does not fully capture what, what is happening there. Let me come to the third shock, which is hopefully something where we still have it in our hands to prevent um, the, the full downside risks, and that's the climate transition. Um, I do see um, chances in this one. Mrs. Holzinger mentioned that if we go for renewable investment and in investment in renewable energy, we will have more energy security. So there are definitely upside. There are also chances in this one. The downside risks were also mentioned. Um, I um, heard you saying that technology is not where it should be. Mr. Felbermayr pointed out bottlenecks. So even if we want to invest and we see it as a clear priority to bring about the climate transition, we don't have everything ready um, to have productive investment. And it is clear that in terms of investment chances, this is the biggest booster. This is something which we really may get us out of um, some structural, low-level, low-equilibrium um, trap of investment, which we were seeing for many decades where investment rates in Europe were much too low. So I would say that if I combine catastrophe number two and, the, and climate transition number three, I was counting the voices on the podium of the speakers who see these two things as being a challenge where you have more synergies than trade-offs. What, what do I mean? I want to say many people see this as at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. It soon turned out that this is a magic moment for digitalization. We may see that this war brings less gas dependence for Western Europe and pushes us towards green transition. So I do see those things going hand in hand. I do see not I do see policy dilemmas in the beginning. We have mentioned, Mr. Schneider said this, of course, that sometimes you have to overrule climate objectives now with some immediate policy actions which are necessary to take. Um, but in the long term, I think they go hand in hand. I think that we want to reorient ourselves to the countries with a good energy mix. 
we can take the chance to also reduce the geopolitical risk of our energy portfolio. And I mean, just to throw one last number at you and then say goodbye after a long afternoon. Um, Austria has 32.4% renewable energy in its primary energy supply. Russia has 2.9%. So it's a different club of countries where we want to stand energy-wise. And I think that um, I saw um, most of the speakers on the podium seeing it also as a synergy. We go for less gas dependence. We go for more green energy that goes hand in hand. Of course, it was also very valuable to have one warning voice on the podium and to say it's not as easy. I think that it was also then framed nicely and say it's a problem of relocation. It's a problem of market efficiency. We have to rethink many instruments. Um, but I hope that, and I also count myself belonging to the camp who say, let's reduce gas dependence, let's go for green investment, and let's do it with wise and smart investment. In this sense, I would like to say goodbye. It was wonderful to have you here, and I look forward to having you again for other events at the Austrian Central Bank. Goodbye.